which is why, you know, wherever you are in the country, um, it would be better to look at the stories of, you know, Yarb Doctors and folk healers and things like that. Because, you know, the witch and the Yarb Doctor and the Conjure Man, they all did the same work, just to varying degrees. And the only difference between them was the communal stance or attitude of the community towards that person. You know, whether they believed that they were, you know, a normal person or whether their power came from God or, you know, from the devil. Welcome to the Cosmic Keys Podcast. This is going to be your episode for September 2nd to the 8th, 2019. And we have an awesome interview for you guys with Jake Richards, who is the author of Backwoods Witchcraft, all about Appalachian folk magic. So definitely stay tuned for that. But before we jump into that, we need to talk about this week, man, because we had the page of pentacles and it's Virgo season. A lot's going on. How are you feeling about it, Dan? Well, Virgo season, like I said, is one of my favorite times of the year in general and this past week was was great and we were joking before we started recording that I'm very earth deficient in my chart and don't care about money and don't have a lot of earth in my chart but the planets this past week and going forward are mostly in earth signs so if you are earth deficient if you are wondering what Earth feels like, well, just pay attention to the world around you right now. This is what Earth feels like. And man, I really feel earthy and I felt very earthy this past week. You know, and to me, feeling earthy is like, you know, there's days where you're all up in your head or you're all like fiery and, you know, passionate. And then there's days where you're emotional and moody. And then there's days where you're earthy and you're just like, heavy on the couch savoring food you know taking naps i i freaking love earth energy and wish my chart had more but um in relation to the card we drew yeah i felt a lot of that earth energy and you know last week was a lot of uranus trining different planets we had uranus trine literally five different planets and with the trine happening you know I wouldn't say last week was like a crazy Uranian, like chaotic week, but I did have this like spark and this like excitement and this um, optimism. And I think that came through really well with the trine. But how about you? How was your week? Oh, it was good. You know, I met some new people again from the kind of occult, witchy, spiritual community in Chicago. So that was maybe a little bit of that Uranian unexpected energy coming in. Who'd you meet? Oh, just just some people. I'll I'll meet you or I'll show you them later. We'll hang out later. <laughs> but um no, it was good. I'm definitely feeling the the Virgo Earth energy too. Um like today I made a loaf of bread, you know. I've been cleaning a lot, you know. That's to me very the kind of sense of home is very earth energy in my view. So, I've definitely been capitalizing on that and using it for positive Um, purposes but also the page of pentacles i mean we're almost done with the cosmic keys website and that's a very kind of page of pentacles kind of you know effort that we're putting in right now and we're really excited we'll let you know when it is live because it's gonna be the most beautiful sexy website you've ever seen for a podcast yes and one other very important thing is we are going to be announcing right now the winner of the Cosmic Keys giveaway. Dun, dun, dun. So our lucky winner for this second giveaway for Virgo season is... Twitter user Cardboard Wine. And I think I know who this user is. I believe this is Miranda, one of our loyal fans that we love hearing from on our Instagram. So we're super stoked that she is the winner um, so congratulations to Miranda, Twitter user Cardboard Wine. And thanks to everybody that participated and helped us with the review thing. Um, you know, if you are a listener and you like the show, we're giving it to you for free. We're happy to do that. And writing us a little review is an easy way to help us out and pay it forward. So, And if you're looking to help us out a little bit more, 
definitely check out our Patreon because we want to keep this thing going for as long as possible because we love you guys and we love giving you your weekly forecasts. So definitely check that out too. So we need to draw a card for this upcoming week and I gave a little peek at the astrology and all I'll say is that I'm very curious what kind of card next week brings. Is it going to be Cray next week? What's going on? A lot of good stuff? I'm not going to spoil it until we see the card. <laughs> okay, okay. Let me let me cut the deck a couple times. I always cut the deck until I'm vibing it, so sometimes it takes me a minute. Oh, yeah. That, well, that's why the cards are always so relevant to the forecasts, you know, because that's how we roll. Well, we're about to see if that's true. You ready? Ready. Knight of Wands. Yeah, baby. We're staying in the court cards. We've been we've been getting a lot of court cards on this show. Knight of Wands is totally like a confident bro in both a good way and a bad way. So the Knight of Wands, he's like in the image. He's just like rearing up his horse because he likes to show off. He knows all the ladies are looking at him. He knows he's out for a good time. So this is someone who has confidence up the wazoo also someone who definitely acts before they thinks doesn't really necessarily care about people's emotions too much but is probably going to go far because they have that insane sense of optimism and drive and energy and they really feel like their world is their oyster and they're just gonna attack it and go for it but you got to worry about that shadow side um, because you really worry with this card that you might be jumping into too much, taking on too much than you can handle, perhaps. And, you know, might some start some fires, you know, that you're going to have to put out later. So that's the only warning with this card, but it really is excitement with this one. I mean, he's a knight, so here you have that kind of adolescent energy and attitude towards things. And here it's fire, so it's action, it's passion, it's creativity, it's drive. Um, So those are the things you're going to want to think about this week as you're approaching this week. On the one hand, go for it, be confident, understand that you're an effing badass, (laughs) and enjoy it, I would say. But, you know, just have a little twinge of being careful there, too. So, yeah, what do you think, Dan? Um... That is a, like I said, I looked at the astrology and I knew there was going to be something energetic about this week. And that's a very energetic card for sure. You know, I'm, I'm a fire heavy person. I'm all fire. No, no earth, <laughs> no, all fire. No earth. I've got some water too. So I'm very fiery and then kind of emo and self-loathing, but um, not a lot of air, I, even though I, I think a lot. I get in my head a lot. Are we kind of opposites in that way? Because I have a lot of air, but also Earth, right? Yeah, you have a Capricorn moon, Venus, uh, Venus and Virgo, and but you're Aries rising, so that's pretty fiery. Yeah. And Libra, Mercury, Mercury and Libra, and uh, Sun and Libra, um, and you're very Libran for sure. Um, but yeah, you have you have more air and Earth than me. I have all fire. <laughs> <laughs> well, this card's for you then this week. Yeah, uh, very manic. I mean, the Knight of Wands. It's I, I like how in the uh, court cards how the two um, masculine elements uh, of the wands and swords. The the horse is like charging or like leaping, and move, there's movement. And then um, the two like yin feminine cards, uh, the cups and coins. The horse is like stable and they're just like sitting. So, yeah, I always find that amusing with like the Knight of Swords. He's like rushing towards the battle because he like has a good sense of morality. He's going to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. And then the Knight of Wands like, okay, I'm going to the battle. But first, let me show off for the ladies. (laughs) (laughs) So that's the difference right there between those two. Yeah, I love the salamander motifs too on his, his clothes. Yeah, you'll see that in all of the court cards for the wands. They all have that salamander motif. Traditionally, in alchemy, too, the salamander being an animal closely associated with the element fire. Nice. Well, that's good to know. And um, this week, God, you have to be patient with me as I go through everything happening this week because 
as we stated on previous shows, there's a huge pileup of planets in Virgo at the moment. So right now, we have Mercury, Venus, Mars, and the Sun. That's four personal planets all in Virgo. And last week, all these planets were trining Uranus. So, okay, you have to think about the astrology right now. Uh, as a sequence all these planets that are in Virgo are going through the sequence of aspecting these major other (laughs) planets and other signs so last week we got the trine with Uranus first now the next step is the trine with Saturn after that the square with Jupiter and after that the opposition with Neptune so that sounds really complicated but um, basically, you know, all of these planets are over this week and next week going to be hitting first the trine with Saturn, second the square with Jupiter, and third the opposition with Neptune. So th- that's four major aspects for four personal planets all happening one after the other. And then some of these four planets are going to be conjuncting with each other this week because they're all really close together. So there is just a lot happening, and I'm going to try to do my best to sum everything up concisely for you guys. So Monday, September 2nd, Labor Day, um, we start the day off with the uh, waxing moon in Libra. Um, Coming off the weekend, Libra moon vibes. It's still going to be in Libra on Monday, and we'll enter Scorpio Monday evening at 7.35 p.m. Eastern Time. So um, the first aspect is the sun is going conjunct with Mars. So sun and Mars are in the same zone of Virgo on Monday at early morning, Monday at uh, 6.42 a.m. So the sun is your planet of yourself, your identity, your ego, blending with Mars, the planet of action, willpower, um, high, it's a high energy conjunction where your identity and your true self, I would say, has this sort of like this Martian energy to, to help you act. So when I was thinking about this aspect, I was thinking, you know, like, what, what do you love to do that's unique to yourself? What, what actions do you like? Like, is it a hobby? Is it a physical fitness? What action makes you feel like comfortable in your own skin like you're living your true will do that on monday so if you know if you're a musician practice music all day on monday if you're an artist draw all day monday like do the thing that brings you joy on monday when the sun is conjunct mars because like it'll help your true self blossom and the martian energy helps you do it helps you act so that's happening on monday Another thing happening on Monday is love planet Venus is going to be squaring expansive planet Jupiter. So Venus is the furthest along in Virgo right now, and she has just reached that point of squaring Jupiter. So Sunday, she trined Saturn, and then right after that, she squares Jupiter. So Venus and Jupiter are the two benefic planets, Venus being more related to love, beauty, relationships and Jupiter more related to abundance, good fortune, optimism, and sort of high spiritual goals. So these two planets squaring each other, even though it's like a hard aspect, the square can be sort of harsh. It's still two positive planets. So it might might make you very lovey-dovey in an almost blown up way. It might make you... It could be a good day to literally just buy a lotto ticket. I'm just going to throw that out there. It's lucky. Hey, if they win, they better share the winnings with us, right? Yeah, right, guys? (laughs) So, yeah, I mean, the two benefic planets squaring each other should probably bring some optimism and good vibes. So Monday is a pretty good day. And when we look at the Knight of Wands, you know, that's energetic right there. Sun, Mars, Venus, Jupiter, that's, that's high energy. So moving along to Tuesday, the next conjunction we have with this Virgo pileup is communication planet Mercury 
conjuncting Mars and then conjuncting the sun. So th- talk about a pile up. We have Mars, the sun and Mercury all in the same spot in the sky. And, you know, this is really powerful stuff. And coincidentally, our website might be released at that very spoiler alert special <laughs> moment in time. Of course, we spoke like picked a specific time and date to release our website. Exactly. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, the, the Mercury conjunct Mars, um, that is going to make your speech, your thoughts, your communications very warlike and energized. And I don't think it's like a negative thing. I think it's just going to put some spunk in what you're communica- communicating and it's going to drive your message forward. And with the sun conjunct Mercury, this is the Mercury Kazemi where um, it's like the full moon of Mercury. And what does Kazemi mean? Kazemi is basically means in the heart of the sun. So if you remember um, the last Mercury retrograde, that we had was in July, and that's when Mercury was, um, what sign was it retrograde in? So when Mercury was retrograde in July, that was in, uh, it started in Leo and then moved back into Cancer. So this point, the Kazemi, is the midway point between that last Mercury retrograde and the next one that's just around the corner. It's, at, it's the point where Mercury is at the highest speed in the sky, and it's basically in the heart of the sun. So it's a really good day for all things Mercury. It's like the full Mercury moon. So, yeah, that's very significant. Um, Mercury, Mars, and the sun are all in the same degrees. Basically, on Tuesday, the day of Mars, all gets me thinking back to that card we drew, the Knight of Wands. So, yeah, Monday, Tuesday, high energy, high potential for you know, getting shit done. All this is in Virgo. So this is all going to be affecting the Virgo stuff, the organization, the delineation of tasks, you know, the planning and the serving. That's all really good stuff. So keep an eye out for that on Tuesday. By Wednesday, um, the the moon in Scorpio will move into Sagittarius late in the evening at 11.08 p.m. Eastern. But before that happens, the third thing in this chain of events that I talked about is happening with Venus. So Venus is going to be opposite Neptune on Wednesday. And this Neptune opposition that's going to be happening to all these piled up planets at some point, you know, that can cause confusion, fantasies, you know, substance abuse, perhaps you might have the urge to be like on cloud nine in one way or the other, whether that's with the help of substances or not. So like, as all these planets oppose Neptune, just be really careful. Like, don't don't fall for fantastical stuff that's not grounded in reality. Don't overindulge in anything I mean, if, and if you do, just do it in a safe way and just know that that's kind of normal. And just, you know, before you, like, go off the rails, just sort of um, take a step back and wait for these Neptune oppositions to pass. So, yeah, like I said, Venus is our prime example right now. Sunday, or I guess last week she trined Uranus. Last Sunday she trined Saturn. Monday she squared Jupiter. And then by uh, Wednesday, she's opposing Neptune. So she's leading the way. All these other planets in Virgo are going to do that later on as well. So Wednesday, as this is happening, you know, it could be a good time for creativity now that I think about it. Because Neptune is very creative and um, visual and sort of otherworldly. And Venus is art in a lot of ways. And it's also relationships. So don't fall for fantasies about relationships on this day maybe try to use it more productively with a creative task you know um moving on from wednesday so thursday mercury is going to be trining saturn so mercury trined uranus on sunday and mercury conjuncted the sun tuesday now it's time for Mercury to trine Saturn. So when anything trines Saturn, 
it puts some structure into the mix. It puts stability into the mix. With Mercury trining Saturn, it's going to make your mind nice and focused. It's going to make your communication precise and effective. So this is a really good Mercury week and par- partially why we're probably going to release our website this week. Um, you know, the Kazemi with the sun, powerful. The trine with Saturn, powerful. Before, the trine with Uranus, also powerful. So Mercury is going to... Um, structure everything up nicely with the help of Saturn on Thursday and by Friday oh I forgot another thing in this sequence so (laughs) Venus is hitting another um, trine with Pluto by Friday so god I hope you guys are still with me there's just so many aspects happening this week um Venus will try and Pluto, so, you know, she opposed Neptune, which put the fantasy thing in your relationships and art. Now it's trining Pluto, which is like the deep, dark shadow work in a nice trine way. So Venus is, that's happening to Venus on Friday, late at night. Mercury is going to square Jupiter early on Friday morning. So when Mercury squares Jupiter... That has a tendency to make your thoughts like kind of like over the top and manic in a way. Um, It can make you like go off on tangents. I remember when we were recording an episode in Mercury Square Jupiter, we all were just blab, blabbing, blabbing, and we were on all these tangents. So like if you're if you have an overactive mind on Friday, that's normal. The sun will try and Saturn. So (laughs) all of these crazy things that have been going on with your identity, with your ego, by Friday, Saturn will solidify that up too. Um, So yeah, that happens on Friday. Saturday, uh, the moon enters Capricorn early in the morning on Saturday, and Mercury is going to oppose Neptune that day. So the same fantasy thing that happened on Wednesday with Venus happens on Saturday with Mercury. That's another time where maybe you, it could be very poetic, I would say. Like the the Mercury opposing Neptune causes like the fantasy and the dream world to enter your speech. So I feel like, you know, write some poetry that day. Then finally Sunday, Sun squares Jupiter, expansiveness to your ego so don't let your ego go out of check on sunday as that happens and then mercury trines pluto just like venus did so your thoughts and communication are going to have that deep dark shadowy rawness in a good way so guys i tried my best that's just a lot of shit to cover in one week um Make sure to follow us on social media because I do clarify further the details of these things. And I know it's a lot to think about, but just to sum it up, think about it. There's four planets in Virgo. They're going through the the row of aspects. First, the trine with Uranus. Second, the trine with Saturn. Third, the square with Jupiter. Fourth, the opposition with Neptune. And fifth, the trine with Pluto. So, God, I mean, like, this week, stuff is in motion right now. Like, stuff is happening, and I feel like a lot of changes are about to come through. But this is powerful stuff, and this is positive stuff, and I feel like the card reflects that really well. So, I hope that was easy to follow. I get it if it wasn't. If you want further clarification, follow us on Twitter, follow us on Instagram, and follow us on TikTok too. Oh yeah, we've joined the Gen Zers on TikTok <laughs> as of this week. <laughs> we've seen lots of Stevie Nicks witchy clips um, of the Gen Zs. There's lots of, as they call themselves, baby witches on TikTok. See, like I would make fun of them, but then I realized I was them. I just didn't have social media at the time. So we can't make too much fun of them. Yeah, we could do a whole episode where I ramble about this platform. I'm really fascinated by it. And I actually want to put a lot of content on there ultimately because I think I think it is kind of like the new Snapchat, to be honest. But the generational differences between us dark millennials and these like bright 
smiley, complimentary Gen Zs is like night and day. Let me tell it. Like they, they, I'm not used to getting these like fake compliments on every video we put. Like you're so handsome and inspiring. And at first I'm like, Oh, Oh, thank you. Like my Leo self loves that. But then I'm like, is that a bot? Or is that a human? I don't even know. Well, if you need some ego check, you should just start a YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can enjoy all those great trolls. <laughs> yeah. Well, guys, thanks for listening to our forecast this week. We, of course, want to hear how your week is going. So like Dan said, follow us on social media because we're going to be digging into all these details, what's going on, and we want to see how they play out in your life. And you're going to want to stay tuned because we have a wonderful interview coming up next with Jake Richards of the Active Jewish Cross. So stay tuned for that. talking to Jake Richards, and he is the author of Backwoods Witchcraft, Conjure and Folk Magic from Appalachia. So Jake, we are so excited to have you on today. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you for asking. How are you doing? Oh, we're doing great. And I'm especially interested to chat with you because I'm actually originally from Appalachia in Tennessee, and we both live in Chicago now, but... I've always been curious on what the culture was like that I could have grown up with, but did not because we moved away when I was in school. So I'm really Mm -hmm. excited to talk to you all about Appalachia. And usually we kind of start our discussions by learning a bit about you and what it was like for you growing up in that region and in terms of spirituality, if you grew up with any religion or anything like that. Uh, yeah, we primarily grew up as free will uh, Baptist. Um, my mama's father was a Baptist preacher, um, but it wasn't really as strict as you know most people think it is, because um, he was also able to you know do some of this work. He was a folk healer, so because he when he was really young, really young, uh, his father passed away. Um, apparently had a heart attack, but we were always told for some reason he got hit by a train. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. But, uh, because he had never laid, laid, laid eyes on his father, um, he was able to, uh, cure thrush in a, like in a baby's mouth. It's like some kind of infection that sets up, but he could also, uh, stop the flow of blood with a Bible verse, uh, take fever out with an egg and all sorts of stuff. So the, the lines, you know, the strict lines that are usually regarded towards religion didn't really apply, uh, with my family and with greater Appalachia growing up. And my mother is actually a seventh daughter. So she's also always had the, um, you know, the, the healing touch, meaning she can simply, you know, heal a malady or an ailment simply by touching it and, you know, praying or anything like that. (laughs) So it wasn't really, you know, strange or anything like that. We really didn't, you know, question anything that was done or, you know, old superstitions or anything like that was followed because that's just what, you know, everybody did. And those were just stories that we grew up on. So it was kind of like second nation, uh, second nature for us. Yeah, it's super interesting. And like when I was reading your book, um, it was super cool to to get to know, you know, like the cultural background of that whole region that goes back to, you know, 
uh, the Scotch Irish and also Native American lore and even, you know, some like African lore. For our listeners, like, could you give us just the Cliff Notes version of, you know, the Appalachian cultural background in terms of like where these folk traditions all came from? Well, as it is today, it's a it's a huge mixture of a bunch of different cultures that came into Appalachia during different influxes, um, you know, immigration to the new new world, and that came from you know Ireland, Britain, uh, I believe in my area in East Tennessee, we had a large influx of uh, Scandinavian and France immigrants, um, as well as uh, some German and some Italian, and then those that folklore kind of, you know, mixed together and mingled as well with those of the local native tribes, whether it was the uh, Eastern Band of the Cherokee or uh, what was the other one? Choctaw. I always get all the C ones mixed up. Uh, Choctaw, Cherokee, and uh, so on and so forth down the south. Whether it was, you know, sharing herbal remedies or you know, folk superstitions that kind of took on a different life of their own based on, you know, the superstitions of other cultures and other folk traditions that were a little bit similar. They kind of mixed and created a basically a unique American breed. Yeah, I'm trying to remember back to when I was younger and thinking about the spirit of place of that region and and kind of the concept of the spirit of place is something we talk about a bit about on this podcast. I remember as a kid, I grew up um, near Chattanooga um, by Lookout Mountain. And there was something about wandering around the woods with your friends and knowing that like, all these Indian tribes were there. And people were really into trying to find um, arrow points, arrowheads, things like that. And there was that idea too, that You're never a stone's throw too far away from a Civil War battlefield at the same time. So there was this like weird connection when you're walking through the woods that there had been some serious, you know, historical events that have occurred there that kind of left, in my view, this kind of lasting impression, making it seem somehow like it felt old in a way that a lot of other regions of America don't as much did you have like a similar experience with that um yeah um well you know growing up in you know climbing the mountains and playing in the creeks and stuff it wasn't really like a you know like a strange feeling like oh there's something you know special about this it was just always normal um but yeah there's there's a very ancient uh spirit about Appalachia and I think it has mostly to do with because they've been here so long because they were you know millions of years ago they towered the Himalayas so you know they've seen and been through a lot yeah that was something I was fascinated to learn about from your book that the Appalachian Mountains are I think are the second oldest mountain range in the world is that right yeah Wow, that's that's really neat. And you never think about it in that way. <laughs> right. Yeah, like, you know, I grew up here in Chicago. And also the name of your you have a store called Little Chicago. Is that tr- is that right? Uh, yeah, uh, we were we were wondering where the name Little Chicago came from, because we both live in Chicago right now. <laughs> Uh, it was called, I uh, named it Little Chicago because I actually uh, uh, was born and grew up in Johnson City, Tennessee. And back in the, Lord, I don't even know, where, whenever the alcohol prohibition was, um, the crime rate here was just as bad as it was in Chicago at the time. And Johnson City was one of the, uh, you know, main towns during the day. So it was one of the, Only towns in, you know, East Tennessee or in the East Coast that, uh, you know, where trains actually stopped, you know, to, you know, refuel refuel up or anything like that. It was basically like a destination for some people. And that was used to the advantage of, you know, bootleggers. They would, you know, illegally traffic liquor. And there's even uh, folk tales of, I don't know if it's true or not, but I've heard a lot of people say that there's underground tunnels 
um, still under the entire city um, that were used to traffic liquor back and forth. And because of the uh, the trafficking of the liquor, uh, it's always been said that Johnson City was one of Al Capone's hideouts whenever, you know, the cops were, you know, closing in on him. That's so funny because, I mean, talk about synchronicities. We're not too far away from a lot of, you know, Capone spots. Like there's one called the Green Mill here in Chicago that also supposedly had underground tunnels. And it's kind of like a jazz bar. And Capone had these like secret tunnels where he could um, get out if the cops were to come. And Chicago has such a rich tradition of prohibition stories and folklore around that time period. So that's such an interesting connection that I didn't know about with Johnson City. Yeah, so it, it was basically nicknamed Little Chicago. Um, and even in a lot of old houses now, well, the ones that haven't been torn down to build new, new ones, they still have uh, not only like secret passageways under them that was used during the uh, Underground Railroad, but also like secret like cabinets and things in the walls that were used to hide liquor. Yeah. Like I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago and I I don't, I don't know if this is just every, I feel like every suburb in Chicago, the folklore is like, Oh, that spooky area over there. Well, Al Capone used to go over there and do blank. Like there's an area near where I grew up, um, it's it's called Archer Archer Avenue. It's it's like super haunted. There's all these like phantom ghost things, but everybody's like, yeah, Al Capone used to like dump bodies back there, or like Jesus. give. Um, I've heard like he used to give a- abortions to his like prostitutes with like coat hangers, <laughs> which could be just like totally fake, but. It's interesting. My fr- so my f- friend is in real estate in the town Willow Springs. I guess like there's this weird ordinance where you you have to. There's some law about if you find bones on your property because there's all these like bones in in these in that land. So you, there's like this protocol you have to do. I, I don't remember the details, but even if it is like over exaggerated by the folklore. Apparently there are enough bones in Willow Springs from the mobster days where it's like in the books you have to do something through the municipality but yeah the, the the that whole prohibition period is so american and it's such like a a pivotal point in our our whole country's history in a way yeah that's crazy another thing i've been curious to ask you about your experience with Appalachia is it seems like because of the mountains, it was such a kind of isolated place to the extent that a really unique culture formed, which then, you know, became this Appalachian folk magic. Do you feel that kind of as, you know, we're modernizing as, you know, places seem more connected than ever, Do you ever feel like because of monoculture or something like that, that it's going to um, somehow take away some of the uniqueness of that region? Or do you already see that happening in any way? Um, Yeah, definitely. Um, While there is still a little bit of, you know, well, not a little bit, a large portion of isolation. um, I do see the actual culture in the mountains changing um, simply in the time that, you know, I've been growing up, um, whether it's in how, you know, neighbors interact with each other or, you know, anything like that, um, you know, nobody really has time anymore to, you know, just talk to somebody because used to, there would always be groups of people, you know, talking outside gas stations or outside hardware stores, but now everybody's just constantly, you know, on the go. That also has to do with, you know, the shitty shitty economy um you know where people got to get to jobs and everything like that um and i think that also has a huge impact on the underlying folk culture whether it's you know superstitions 
or just, you know, listening to your elders. Nobody really has time for it anymore. Nobody puts too much thought into it. And following the superstitions no longer really is a major part of our life because one, you know, we've disregarded the wisdom of our elders. And number two, we don't put any thought into it. We don't make any connections as to how, oh, why do I have bad luck? Or why did this happen? Or what can stop this from happening or anything like that? Um, so, yeah, I, I believe that, you know, coming into modern times, Appalachian culture has changed. I don't want to say drastically because it's, uh, it basically varies on where you go in Appalachia. Now, if you go somewhere like Knoxville, yeah, the, the culture is going to be totally different. But if you go to a small town like a like a farmer's market in a small town like uh, Weber City, Virginia, then the culture is going to be completely different. Like you'll be able to tell that it's, you know, the same Appalachian culture, but it's almost like some places are stuck in a certain time, if that makes sense. We yeah. kind of like that. <laughs> <laughs> And sorry if you can hear my cat in the background. He's a Siamese and he does not know how to shut up. <laughs> That's okay. I've literally loved on him all day, but he acts like it never happened. We got a cat over here. One of my cat's names is Grigri. And he's chilling out, taking a nap while we're chatting. So... <laughs> um. <laughs> But yeah, no, that's that's super interesting hearing you talk about that. And it's been my perception of kind of the South and the Appalachian region, too, even though I'm not, you know, as familiar of it as you are, of course, is that it has been this kind of becoming more divided between certain areas that are really revitalizing and becoming trendier and then other areas where the jobs just keep on disappearing and there's a lot more struggle with poverty. Um, just even like with Chattanooga, where I grew up, it's really gone through a lot of revitalization in the past few years and is starting to you know, attract young people. And it wasn't really like that when I was growing up there and, and other areas such as Asheville becoming super trendy and popular. Oh, yeah. Um, so it's almost like there's kind of the split in a way where you still have these small towns that are holding on to that Appalachian kind of folk culture and then you have certain cities that are kind of becoming trendy. And then us Northerners just kind of move over there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the the town I live in now, Jonesboro, uh, I believe it was back in the late 60s when it, it was practically a ghost town. Like all of the shops had closed. Most of the people had moved away. And then their number one thing that they've done, that they've done to become so successful was they basically – you know, made tourism their highest commodity because they're the oldest town in Tennessee. And now it's constantly packed down there. <laughs> I hate driving down d through downtown. Yeah, it, it seems like a recurring theme of our show is complaining about stuff getting built over or built up because, you know, anytime a town just gets too built up, like we were saying, it's like the monoculture takes over. Like everywhere has a Starbucks, Panera, Chipotle, and it's a little bit fancier than back when it was just like Chili's, you know, McDonald's, Burger King. But everywhere now, it's like, I don't know. I feel like a lot of the identity is being lost when, you know, we're all so interconnected and these isolated places are sort of. I hope well clearly with people like you you're you're preserving it but um I hope more people take to the preservation side and start caring about history again you know definitely because you know with you know society as it is now it's not you know quite all that stable so we need to learn how to do without what we've you know been privileged to have like cell phones and Facebook and all of that stuff. I mean, even just, you know, electricity. Yeah. Because at any moment it could go down the drain. Totally. Yeah. Um, and Jake, like, I'm curious. So by reading your book, you know, it's, it sounds like you had a family tradition. Uh, it's, it seems like, you know, you're on your mother's side and your father's side, these traditions were taught to you. But with any people that are drawn to this work, I feel like there is still like a, maybe a calling to it or like a, an initiation period where you, you have to sort of face 
the scary sides of it. Like, what was your journey like in general with spirituality? Did you ever go, like, did you stick to the folk traditions of your family or did you ever, like, go off on different paths and explore, like, Wicca or, like, other types of esoteric work? Well, I, I started out with, you know, Wicca for a couple of months at first, um, but it just, it didn't feel right. So then uh, that's when I began, you know, looking into the local folk traditions more. Um, and on my mother's side, as far as we know now, um, it goes back at least, let's see, on Nana's side, it's five generations back to my great, great grandfather, who was a, a water witch. He could find, uh, you know, water witch with a, a forked peach limb. Um, and then on my mother's side, on my on papal's side, her father, or yeah, her father, um, as far as I know, it simply goes back to his mother, who mama said was always burning oil lamps. And when you walked into the house, like back in those days, she didn't have an air conditioner. So it would be, you know, 80 degrees outside and all the windows would be up, but there would still be random cold spots in the house. <laughs> and she said that she said she she loved the woman to death, but she hated going to her house because it felt like the walls themselves were watching her. <laughs> and she said that Memo Siegel always had something burnt, something like powdery burning on the stove for some reason that had a strong musk smell. Um, and then on my father's side, as far as I know, it only goes up to my mama hops and my, uh, my father's maternal grandmother, um, which, you know, she simply knew some, you know, herbal remedies and things like that. Um, but yeah, it's, I, I wouldn't, you know, doubt that a lot of families had, you know, different people throughout their family line who, you know, did this work to varying degrees. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting to hearing you talk about this like long line that you come from. And I wonder, are there like other people that you know of in that region that are also still, you know, doing these practices that come from long lines or are you kind of one of the few people left and you kind of feel this responsibility to, to keep to keep the magic going, I guess you could say. Well, see, with Appalachian folk magic there and, and Conjure, there were varying degrees of practice, basically. So, uh, and this is what I'm, uh, you know, covering on in the second book. You have the uh, faith healers, basically those people who, uh, because back in that day, they, they, every community didn't, you know, have a church that was actually built or a you know, full-on congregation, they had circuit riders. And circuit riders would travel around from community to community and staying for maybe a week or two and, you know, preaching the gospel, doing baptisms, doing marriages and all that. But uh, after the circuit rider left, you know, somebody needed to step up to help the community in some, some form or fashion. Now, back in the, as little as over 100 years ago, there were, you know, we didn't have, you know, Western med medicine as we know it today. And there weren't many uh, schooled and licensed doctors in southern Appalachia as there are today. There were mainly three doctors. There was those who were self-taught, you know, with using herbs and things like that. Those were the yarb or root doctors. Um, and then you had the book-learned uh, physicians or doctors who sometimes also use herbs, but they would also do such things as bloodletting, uh, dry or wet cupping, um, scarification, you know, different, uh, more modern practices of their time. But they, you know, simply learned, self-learned through published books of their time. Um, and then you had, you know, the full-on physicians who were actually licensed through different universities like the University of Knoxville. Um but then aside from that, uh, you know, different people, you know, who were doctors, whether it was, you know, a simple yard doctor, book learned doctor, a school doctor could also be seen using faith healing, which was, you know, laying on of hands, anointing, baptizing, 
uh, praying psalms and different other uh, Bible verses. Um, and sometimes, you know, simply uh, prophesizing, bringing in the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues. Uh, and then, you know, that would be the faith healers. And then the next one would be, you know, the Yarb doctors. They were the ones who cured with herbs and roots. Now, with, with Yarb doctors, not every Yarb doctor worked on, uh, you know, just people. Some people also worked on animals. Some only worked on people, and some only worked on animals. Those were called the horse or cow doctors. You know, they would help with, like, um, I forget what they're called. It's like a big tumor growth thing that grows on a cow's leg or something like that but they would come and they would basically doctor the animal up uh usually you know livestock because back in those days livestock was your livelihood you know you needed to get milk you needed meat you needed uh you know that the animal to help do work on the farm whether it was you know pulling uh luggage or anything like that and there were some faith healers who also used herbs, and they were also Yarb doctors, whereas there was, uh, you know, some Yarb doctors, you know, especially, you know, possible atheists who believed that herbs could help, you know, cure certain things, but they they didn't believe that, you know, prayer could be helpful in healing. And then furthermore, you had the the witch doctor who their specialty was to uh, doctor or cure witchcraft or evil or curses or anything of that nature and then you can see that you know implemented across the other ones like a faith healer could also pray against witchcraft or pray that you know the witchcraft is removed or a yarb doctor could also recommend certain herbs to help expel the witchcraft or you know recommend castor oil be taken to help purge the body of it because some you know, forms of witchcraft or conjure were administered through the food and was thought to poison the, the blood and lodge the intestines and, you know, all that to, you know, make a person sick. So there there's a lot of varying degrees as to, you know, the different practices in uh, Appalachian folk magic and Appalachian conjure. So just because, you know, somebody practices Appalachian folk magic, doesn't necessarily necessarily mean that uh, you know they're a jack of jack of all trades. And just like me, I I mean I know some you know herbal remedies and things like that, but only like of twenty herbs or so. Whereas my uh, Memo Hobson's husband, uh, he knew just about every darn herb and what it could be used for. Um, so I think it it really depends on the um, the, de- the dedication of the person as well as their own personal predisposition for the work. Um, you know, cause some people are born with a gift, just like mama, she was born with the, the healing touch, but she was also born with the sight. So she's able to, you know, see and speak with the dead and see spirits and phantom animals that wander around the land. Um, whereas some people don't have the gift. So it simply depends on those, you know, predispositions and um, exactly what this, what area of work the spirits bring you into. Another interesting thing that really stands out with with your book and and Appalachian folk magic in general is how it's so intermixed with Christianity and the Bible, and all the Bible verses you include that. In themselves, the actual verses, the words kind of having magical properties in a way. And it's it's almost to me seems like an entirely different way of looking at Bible verses that most people, you know, wouldn't have thought of before. I'm just kind of curious about, you know, that intersection of kind of magic and using the Bible as that text to create the magic. Yeah, the the actual Bible, um, it's been a huge mainstay in Appalachian culture um, because back in the day it was one of the only books that, you know, a family had. And oftentimes there would only be like uh, one or a small handful of people in the family who could actually, you know, read the Bible aside from just being told what it said. And I think because of, 
that because there were so many so few people back in the day who could actually read the bible it kind of created a uh what do i want to call it uh basically like a folk religion of sorts and it kind of gave it kind of like helped further furthered the spirit of independence that came in the mountains with you know because we were isolated we had to you know deal with what we had we had to do without we had to basically make it to the next day and I think that spirit of independence was able to lie at the core of that, you know, folk religion, because although they couldn't read or walk, read or write, you know, they were able to, you know, in a sense, in their belief, know the creator of the heavens of the earth. And with, uh, you know, the many examples of magic and healing in the Bible, it furthered the belief that, you know, no hierarchy is needed. And... I always grew up, um, even by, you know, my, uh, papa, the one who was a preacher being told that you don't have to go to church to, you know, be saved or anything like that, that you, you can get saved, you know, sitting on a toilet instead of a pew. It doesn't matter to God. Um, so there, the early on in Appalachia's history, there was, uh, the removal of that, uh, intermediary that came about, With the current, you know, European immigrants who were primarily Catholic. So, you know, they, you know, believe that, you know, there had to be an intercessor intercessor between man and God. And I think with the interminglings of uh, a little bit of the spiritual worldview of the Cherokees, you know, intermingling with those of the immigrants, it kind of created a a flavor of Christianity on all, all on its own. And with, you know, everybody, just about every Christian or old-time Christian in Appalachia, uh, you know, if they pray Bible verses for, you know, protection or healing or, you know, just to, you know, get the help that they need, then, you know, everybody's doing a little bit of folk healing or a little bit of conjure, um, you know, conjuring up that that spirit for aid. But there is a, a large importance place in the Bible, not only because— people wished so much to be able to read it and understand it, but also because, uh, you know, they believe that it is the actual word of God. So they believe that the actual words contain powers. So they would, you know, write Bible verses down or carry them. Or I remember my mother was gifted a, um, it was like a, a bead necklace, except the beads were made out of, slips of paper that were rolled up and glued and each slip of paper had a certain psalm on it and it was like a like a little string of prayer beads so yeah the the bible itself has been utilized in many ways whether it's you know placing the bible under your pillow to you know keep off nightmares leaving it open in the house at you know psalms 23 to ward off evil spirits or anything like that because the the bible also became the center of the family because it held all of the family documents. It basically held the recordings of marriages and deaths and births and, you know, significant events that happened in the community. So it wasn't just a, a history of the actual world. It was a history of our world as well. Yeah, that's really cool. And it makes me think, you know, I've, I, I've lived in Louisiana for a little while and have friends from, um, like, Tennessee in the south and everything. And just, like, the Protestant style of Christianity puts so much more emphasis on the Bible because Catholicism was never, like, meant... Like, the, the Catholics weren't really meant to have their own Bible. They were meant to go to church and have the priest read it to them and for a while bibles were only in latin you know but it was really like the the protestant reformation idea which was like take out this middleman and read the word of god in your native tongue and it was interesting too like seeing in your book all like the king james um phrasings of everything which to me was sounded like because it was You know, the King James Bible was translated back kind of after, like, the Shakespearean times, and the language is very, like, British, like, thou hast, like, blah, like, you know, and it's interesting to to 
connects, you know, that sort of like Anglican tradition to what it is in in America and Appalachia. So, yeah, well, it, it kind of makes sense that the King James Version is the, you know, number one Bible in Southern Appalachia because uh, I forget what they're called. I think they're called ethno ethno something. They study people. Um, they've basically called our dialect. Uh, I believe it was a Shakespeare Elizabethan or something like that. Mm. I can't remember. It was like Elizabeth something it's like it, like calling back to Queen Elizabeth. Yeah. I've I heard the remember. like the Scottish accent um, also really kind of influenced kind of the Southern accent and kind of the way it's very sing songy. Um, yeah. So kind of like filtered through down there. And I'd be curious too, cause I know you mentioned um, what you called like the little people. Those are supposed to be kind of like, like the fairies or the idea of fairies in Appalachia, did that like come down from the Scotch Irish immigrants? I, I think it happened both simultaneously from the old world as well as in the new world because the Cherokee already had their, you know, beliefs in the little people. All of the Native American tribes in America actually did. Um, I think I actually have a blog post on it on my blog. Um, but with the Cherokees, uh, they, you know, recognize the the presence of the, of the little people um so there's always been uh stories of you know the little people in appalachia um but it, i i haven't been able to find you know them often recorded so it seems like it was a um like a like a small belief and it simply depended on you know, where you were and what families were there and so on and so forth. It doesn't look like uh, the stories of the little people, you know, were a widespread uh, folktale that was shared. But uh, with my uh, grandmother, I would always hear a mention of they took him again when she was looking for her keys or, <laughs> you know, anything like that. So, yeah, I didn't actually, you know, grow up you know, being told like, oh, don't do this. The the little people will get you or, you know, anything like that. But it is a very unnoticed underlining in Southern Appalachia in regards to, you know, folk tales and superstitions. Yeah. And with the, the stories of the little people, the, the hardest thing that I found on, you know, trying to find stories of them or tales or anything, you know, something that's, you know, currently living in the culture, um, you know, among the, the old folk or the older families that are still remaining um, is that they aren't always identified as little people. So there will be like tales of, you know, a strange spirit that isn't necessarily specified to be human um, haunting a certain location. Uh, like in uh, Tipton, North Carolina, where my mama Hobson lived, uh, the community was after actually named after the family. And there was a local tale that, uh, whenever kids were crying or throwing a tantrum, that a spirit called Pelt's Nickel would come and like smack switches at the door and say that it was going to, you know, get and whoop the child. Um, but it's never actually specified what, you know, it is that's, you know, switching at the door. Um, and then there were, there are a lot of tales of uh, phantom animals. Uh, like the like the wampus cat, for example, which you know, based on whatever story you look at, has human origins. Um, it isn't always uh, easy to fit it into a you know set cate- category, for, like for instance. Um, or there was also tales of uh, I haven't found many of them, but there's there's tales in. Yeah, Southwest Virginia and uh, Southeast Kentucky. Um, I haven't found it in East Tennessee yet, but it's about a a fiery-eyed cat. Um, And it's apparently a black cat that is simply on fire that runs through the woods at night. So there's not really a, you know, a... An, an explanation for it that could possibly be rooted in the, you know, the real world and this world. Um, 
so yeah, it's weird to find you know things like that and not be able to fit into to a you know certain category. So I think you know just like with the the, the Irish little folk where they took on you know different forms besides just humanoid. I think you know in Appalachia those would you know kind of fit in perfectly. Yeah, it is neat hearing about all these kind of different, I guess, humanoid, cryptoid creatures. And it's always amused me how it seems like every region of America, we all have our own. In an episode or a few episodes ago, we were talking about Mothman when he visited Chicago, uh, supposedly a few years ago. Um, So yeah, I've always wondered about that, you know, what you know, is there any basis in reality for some of these, these tales, these cryptoids, and why they are so, so regional? Yeah, Um, exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Another thing I've been curious about, too, is we talked a bit about kind of the influence of Bible verses into Appalachian folk magic. Um, Do you also kind of have a... um, connection with the ancestors or is there a component of revering the ancestors in uh, the folk magic as well oh yeah the 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 ancestors in one's dead has always been a you know a huge part of you know our lives in in southern appalachia um not so much as it used to be um simply based on you know um the western practice of embalming and funeral funeral homes and all of that so the the dead have kind of moved away to cemeteries instead of being you know just buried on the you know the the property of the homeland um but yeah back in the day um because you know your your great granddaddy was buried you know just a couple of yards away from your front door uh you better keep that grave clean otherwise you're going to have a hand on your hands <laughs> Because, I mean, he's right outside. He knows where you live. He knows where you sleep. So, yeah, the the ancestors in One's Dead are – it's weird with Appalachia because there there isn't a mandatory hierarchy. But whenever we need something, we go through a hierarchy because we've always – I don't know. We have this pride about ourselves. Again, that, you know, that spirit of independence, we hate asking for help. Um, so we will go – you know, through basically like a hierarchy of getting help. Um, and the, the last resort was usually, you know, the conjure man or the, the witch doctor as well as God. Um, but first and foremost, it would be to, you know, pray to your own dead or, you know, speak to your family that's living. Um, and, you know, try to, you know, use all the resources that you can first um, and I think that's also because not everybody wanted to deal with the uh, community conjure man because whereas he was, uh, you know, more more respected and more tolerated than the the witch of the community, um, he still couldn't necessarily be trusted because where, while people didn't necessarily name them a witch, they were a Usually, a, a per, like a normal person in the community, they were an outcasted. They didn't do strange things, you know. They simply, you know, helped people whenever they could. But it wasn't always guaranteed that, you know, their power came from God or their power came from the devil. So it was kind of nobody knew what master he was working for. So you know, they couldn't always be trusted. So before going to that, we would, you know exhaust all resources first and foremost. Yeah. It, it gets me thinking about when I was reading your book and you were sort of talking about, like you're saying the hierarchy of like up from like university educated doctor all the way down to like the witch at the edge of the woods that sold their soul to the devil and stuff. Could you, for our listeners sort of explain a little bit about, that witch concept, you know, because it sounds like witches in Appalachia aren't like, you know, Wiccans in modern times that are just sort of like nature pagan folks. These are sort of more like diabolical, um, evil folks, right? (laughs) 
Well, yeah, in the in the most popular tales, they are equated with you know demons and selling their soul to the devil and consorting with evil. Um, but in the large majority of the the folk tales that surround witches and witchcraft, there's really no mention of you know demons or anything diabolical like that. Um, and that's why I've termed that's why I term it the the folk witch because a lot of times a person who was named a witch in the community wasn't actually a witch at all. So, and all the stories never really uh, had a foundation on you know, actual acts or anything that the person actually did. It was just the, basically the community exaggerating a little bit too much, which I mean, you know, storytelling is a, a huge part of the culture. So a lot of stories were exaggerated to, you know, make them scary and everything like that. So it's really hard to try and find a true factual basis in folk tales that regard, you know, witchcraft. Um, which is why, you know, wherever you are in the country, um, it would be better to look at the stories of, you know, Yarb doctors and folk healers and things like that. Because, you know, the witch and the Yarb doctor and the conjure man, they all did the same work, just to varying degrees. And the only difference between them was the communal stance or attitude of the community towards that person. You know, whether they believed that they were, you know, a normal person or whether their power came from God or you know, from the devil. Yeah. So <laughs> would you say then like the witch was kind of the lowest on that totem pole then um, was kind of the yeah. the real outcast in the community that, you know, people assumed she was doing curses and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and, and with the witch in Appalachia, it wasn't, there's actually no records of actual, uh, you know, witch burnings or, you know, executions of a person because of witchcraft. It always kind of stayed at, you know, excommunication or, you know, public shunning. But essentially the witch did the same thing as the, you know, the local witch doctor or the Yarp doctor. But, you know, he or she was convicted for the same acts done by a better man. So, yeah, with and, and with, you know, with that same attitude towards witchcraft, even with you know, curses or hexes or illnesses caused by uh, another person, even if that person wasn't named a witch in the community by the community as a whole, and, you know, they were like a res like a respected witch doctor or anything like that, and they were simply hired by another person to make the curse. They weren't called a witch, but the act itself was actually called witchcraft instead of, you know, conjure or roots or anything like that. So witchcraft was the actual diabolical means of you know, cursing or hexing or causing unnatural illness or causing disease in livestock or anything like that without having to actually be sent by a witch or somebody who was named a witch in the community. Yeah, it gets me thinking too. Um, I was wondering, you know, because it seems like you're very open to your, you know, the folk traditions of Appalachia and everything. But, like, what is your relationship with Christianity? Like, do you identify still as a Christian at all? Do you identify as a Baptist at all? Or is it sort of, like, a, a different than that for you? Well, it's, it's a little bit weird because my immediate family, um, we didn't always go to church, even though, you know, Pablo was a preacher. Um, so we all kind of develop, developed our own relationship with God individually. Um with me, I've always, you know, saw something spiritual in nature, you know, constantly being in nature. I mean, it's impossible to not, you know, see the beauty and actually feel something when you actually grow up in the woods and the mountains and playing in creeks and catching crawfish and stuff like that. But I also have a, me and my brother both have an affinity for, you know, the Virgin Mary. So while we don't, you know, stay within those strict confines of modern or orthodox Christianity, you know, we still believe in, you know, God and stuff, but we like to call ourselves Catholic Baptist just because of the weird way, you know, we've developed in that relationship. That's interesting. Do you ever feel any inner conflict with like, you know, performing magic because it's such a taboo kind of traditionally within Christianity or are you ever worried about other people in the community finding out about your interest? 
Well, see, that's the weird thing with it, because with, you know, all of the the tales of witchcraft and witches in Appalachia, um, the Bible isn't really brought into the conversation that much, unless, you know, you look at the exaggerated folk tales of how one becomes a witch, whether it's reading Bible verses backwards, saying the Lord's Prayer backwards, uh, standing on the oldest grave in the family cemetery and renouncing God. Um, it doesn't really come up that, that much in uh, the culture and community here, um, at least as, you know, from what I've experienced. Um, and because just about every every community here follows random superstitions and, you know, things that were help, that were handed down to them from the old folks, um, I've never really, you know, saw any conflict with it. Um, and, you know, looking at the, you know, at the text in the Bible itself, I mean, you can see where Jesus himself cursed a fig tree simply because it wasn't blooming in the right season. So it makes me wonder... Is there, is your work considered taboo in your community at all, like to any extent? Well, not really taboo, but in in Appalachia, there's always the belief that, you know, people can can do things, they can you know make things happen, um, just like with the the witch doctor or the conjurer conjurer back in the day, um, they were you know more more respected than the the folk witch was. Um, it, it was more like instead of, because at Southern Appalachia is, you know, we have such a large spirit of independence. We also, because of our circumstances can't always, you know, go by God's time. So there's always been that possibility of, you know, uh, twisting the hand of nature or, you know, forcing the hand of God to enact change, um, but but no, as long as you know, there's you know there there's never really been a, an equation of uh, you know conjure folk magic or anything like that with the you know the devil or the diabolical. So yeah, it's never really actually became taboo. And as far as I've you know been able to find in my studies, the only primary reason that you know nobody actually self identified as a witch was because the witch wasn't somebody you wanted to be. That was the, the person who was excommunicated from everybody, from friends and family and everything like that. Um, so, of course, nobody was going to, you know, say, oh, I'm a witch, because, you know, they didn't want to go through that, you know, being isolated and even more alone in the mountains. Yeah, that's... because so, because So there's not really, you know, a basis of, oh, no, I don't worship the devil. It's like, oh, no, um, I'm a good person. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's very different from today when you have so many uh, people who are eager and wanting to use the term witch to describe themselves and their spirituality. And I personally just kind of call myself pagan as opposed to a witch. But um, it is fascinating to see, you know, just in um, my lifetime, how the word witch has become such a a um a common thing that people aspire to be i guess you could say um so yeah that's that's interesting hearing that it's not as um common you know down in appalachia and it's also neat too kind of the the lack of as much stigma that someone who is looking at these kind of old folk practices receives um in appalachia compared with you know in my experience when i'm talking to a lot of people um, who are really afraid to talk about things um, that might be spiritual or maybe it's about Wicca or witchcraft because of their communities being so religious. Um, so that's that's an interesting uh, comparison, I think, um, with how things are, are done in the mountains. Yeah. You know, another thing I wanted to ask you about just because I'm I'm a bit curious um you mentioned like haint like h-a-i-n-t and that's Mm -hmm. that's a word I first learned about maybe like five years ago when I visited New Orleans for the first time and I was on some type of like ghost tour or maybe it was the Garda District tour and they were showing all the blue porch ceilings and how it was a specific shade of blue called haint blue and you're supposed to paint 
the top of your porch in this color to kind of prevent the haints or spirits from getting in. So is a haint just like a, a spirit or a ghost or is it kind of something specific? Well, in, in my in, in my experience in, you know, doing house cleansings and everything like that, uh, a lot of things can fit into the category of a haint. It's basically any any spirit, whether it's, you know, a blood ancestor or just a wandering soul or, you know, just even, you know, a different phantom spirit. Um, it's any spirit that basically causes harm or trouble in the house um, and oftentimes doesn't have any – uh, logical explanation behind or, you know, explanation or motive behind its actions. Hmm. So it's just like a natural troublemaker, basically. I guess the modern world, modern word would be poltergeist. That is interesting. Did you have any kind of experiences when you were growing up that really kind of stand out as like a haint or a poltergeist activity? Um, I don't know. Every house we moved into, Mama kind of always, you know, went ahead and took care of that. Um, there was a little bit of time when we believed that there was something in the house because uh, cabinet doors would slam shut, doors, you know, bedroom doors would slam shut, light bulbs would just burst, and we would find these weird handprints. Um, oh, that's spooky. <laughs> we're like. It, it wasn't a normal handprint. It's like it was like two times larger than the average person's. And the fingers oh, were extremely long. But they would be handprints up on the wall right up at the ceiling. And it would be like oily handprints that wouldn't come off of the, you know, the paint on the wall. So, like, we couldn't wash it off or scrub it off or anything like that. But, yeah, I that's really the only only experiences, you know, I've had growing up. Uh, you know, living in a house where, you know, there was a pro, you know, problems or trouble with haint. I kind of like the the word haint more for that type of stuff because we always joke that people just think everything is demons now. And oh, lord, yes. <laughs> and if <sighs> if there's like, a, I don't know, I've had poltergeisty experiences too when I was younger. And um, my Catholic household was like, it's probably demons. Put a crucifix next to your bed or whatever, blah, blah, blah. But, I mean, I don't know. The paranormal activity is so weird and, like, random. And poltergeist is a good word to explain. It's just random energy that's disruptive. And I feel like haints, uh, the idea of a haint is similar to that because I, I don't like... Pe pe like pegging everything as like this little minion from Satan himself that came from the depths of hell to drag you down to hell. Yeah, I think they have more important things to be doing than to scare you with a busting light bulb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think we were talking to someone, Dan, maybe previously, I'm trying to remember, but they were mentioning how with like poltergeist activity, it's very kind of specific and it's something that we could potentially create through our own kind of emotional energy especially it being prominent when you're like a teenager or a kid um, perhaps where it's just kind of this um, exuberance of our own emotions kind of being projected out into the world that's causing kind of random bangs and light bulbs crashing that kind of real random stuff like i've always been curious is that just us <laughs> our mm -hmm. own kind of uncontrolled energy kind of becoming a force um but yeah i just think that's that's an interesting i've always been fascinated by poltergeist activity the thing i liked about your book is the way that you were telling everything from a really personal point of view telling family stories. And I just got the sense that you had like a ton of reverence and respect for your own family and your own traditions and your history. Definitely. And I thought that was super admirable. And myself as sort of a, a woo woo guy that's into this stuff, you know, I sometimes get the urge to leave Chicago and I'm like, 
uh, in the back of my head, I'm like, yeah, I got to go somewhere where there's more nature. I got to go somewhere else. I got to run away. But then, like, the pull of my family is always what keeps me here. And the pull of the land here and the history here is weirdly what keeps me here. And, you know, I was even thinking, you're talking about family graves and stuff. Like, I've had crazy experiences of, like, literally discovering my family's graves. And both sides of my family are buried on, like, the south side of the city. And so, like, I... I'm wondering, like, what what is the importance of staying put and staying close to the land? Like, have you ever had the urge to leave the mountains or do you ever get restless and want to sort of pick up and leave? And what's like the the benefits of staying where your your roots are? Oh, definitely. I think everybody here, you know, at certain points in in their life, you know, they just want to leave and pick up. And I've always wanted to, you know, move and leave. But, you know, again, those same things, family and the, you know, the pool of the land, it's, it, you know, it's all I've ever known. Um, I think that's why a lot of people are, you know, essentially stuck here. Because in, in Appalachia, we depend a lot on each other. Um, and that's why there is, you know, so much reverence for family, um, you know, whether they're living or dead. Because quite literally, we, you know, grow up seeing the trials and tribulations that our parents and grandparents and so on had to go through to basically get us here and get us to the point that we are. So it kind of feels like um, simultaneously we stay out of love and reverence for the land, but also out of kind of – a sense of that we need to be here to, you know, help our family and pay off the debt that we've accrued in our lifetime with the, the, the work, blood and sweat and tears that they put into, you know, our upbringing and getting us to the point where we are. Yeah. It's, it's interesting hearing you talking about kind of that, that pull of family and, and almost that like debt that you have to kind of repay. Um, when I moved, I was like, in grade school, and we moved because my dad um, got accepted to law school. So we moved up to upstate New York, and it caused a huge rift. My dad was the first person to ever leave the South, um, to leave the family. And in a way, we were never the same. We were, from that point on, you know, Yankees to a certain degree. Um, yeah. And it's been such a, a struggle for me, too, because I've grown up in in Tennessee and then upstate New York and then I, you know, lived in Wisconsin while I was in college and then, you know, lived in various areas and now I'm in Chicago. I feel like I like am missing kind of there's like a hole because I never stayed anywhere long enough to establish real roots. And my family is just kind of everywhere. I have family in probably like 10 to 12 different states. So I'm like completely ungrounded. Um, on the one hand, that gives me a sense of freedom and like I just I totally am able to travel and go wherever I want. But a part of me wishes that I had what you have, um, which is that kind of deep um, ancestral connection to a place and to the nature of an area. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm living vicariously through you <laughs> while reading your book. I find it fascinating. Well, it sure as hell is a double-edged sword. <laughs> it is, yes. <laughs> definitely. As we start to wrap up, like for our listeners, definitely check the book out. It's there's so much in there. Like you pack a lot into one <laughs> into each chapter and there's a bunch of chapters. So there's like so much to sort of use yourself and for me, like I said, I was raised Catholic and I I do do ancestor work and I do have more of a sort of like pagan perspective these days. But I feel like to connect with my own ancestors, which were all Catholic, you know, maybe incorporating more Bible stuff is helpful and maybe using Christian iconography in more of a witchy way is a better way to make a genuine connection with my own past. So, so I'm definitely going to be using that in my own life. Um, 
But um, for our listeners, where can they learn more about your work and where can they find you? Uh, well, they can find me on my website at littlechicagoconjure.weebly.com. Um, I also do a, I also run a blog called Holy Stones and Iron Bones um, on uh, wordpress.com. And then they can also find me on Facebook, uh, on Instagram as, Lord, I forgot my Instagram name. Um, it's Jake Richards something. <laughs> I think it's Jake Richards underscore 13. And then Twitter is Jake Richards underscore 131. So I, I pulled up your Instagram. It's Jake underscore Richards 13. Ah, okay. I knew there was an underscore in there somewhere. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thanks again so much for chatting with us. And again, for our listeners, definitely we would recommend picking up his book called Backwoods Witchcraft. So thanks again. It was wonderful having this chat with you. Yeah, thank you for having me. All right, guys, thanks for sticking with us through the entire episode. We had a great time talking with Jake Richards, author of Backwoods Witchcraft. Sorry for releasing this episode a little late. It is Labor Day, and there were some editing difficulties with this one. We have currently we have some microphone issues, so we apologize for the staticky poppy noise that you had to endure for this interview it does not meet the cosmic keys standards and we're going to get a new mic purchased pretty soon to help us with that purchase though you could always join our patreon uh, patreon.com slash cosmic keys to sign up you will get the extended versions of episodes where we leave all the raw stuff we leave the extra interesting stuff for you so sign up on patreon.com if you'd like to support our show other than that though follow us on social media and we will talk to you all next week take care